But today, and from its inception and into the future, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences has been a pioneer for purpose-driven research. We work across disciplines to tackle the challenges of our time through world-renowned research, education, and outreach. And the questions we probe and the answers we seek focus on three overlapping areas, um, natural and human systems, food, energy, and environmental resources, and social, physical, and economic well-being. CALS connects the life, agricultural, environment, and social sciences to provide world-class education, to spark unexpected discoveries, and to inspire pioneering solutions that have impact in New York State and all across the world. A critical component of our commitment to purpose-driven science is putting knowledge and research to work to create positive impact. Students and faculty go far beyond the boundaries of our campus to partner with communities, explore ideas, and solve difficult, complex problems. Cornell's legacy of international engagement is unmatched among our peer institutions in the US and abroad. CALS has been engaging in meaningful, formal international collaborations for a century. And today, Cornell faculty, students, and staff are engaging with international collaborators to make a difference in 81 different countries around the world. And you can see um, those countries reflected on this map. So the global challenges we face today are unprecedented in scale and scope. Food and agriculture is at the heart of the challenge of feeding the 9 to 10 billion people who we expect to inhabit this planet in 2050. And it's a planet that at the same time will be stressed by climate change, migration, and political instability, all of which are expected to negatively impact food production and food security. Unprecedented challenges require creative approaches from the people at the institutions who lead the way in purpose-driven science, and Cornell and CALS is leading the way. Solutions to transboundary global challenges require strong global partnerships, and they also require partnerships with donors who are committed to our shared value of equity, of evidence, of justice, and urgency. Increasingly, a rising share of grant and endowment support for Cornell projects comes from private philanthropists, some of whom are Cornell alumni and some of whom are not, but they're all impressed by Cornell's level of engagement and ability to have an impact globally. So in the next hour or so, we'll hear about four large externally funded projects. And these projects are diverse in their deliverables and approaches, but all four leverage Cornell's capacity and leading edge science to positively impact the world. In our challenge to feed nine plus billion in the face of a changing climate, the tools of plant breeding will be increasingly important. We'll hear how projects like the Genomic Open Source Breeding Informat Informatics Initiative, or GOBI, and the Delivering Genetic Gain in Wheat, or GG DGGW, projects are applying leading edge science to address major constraints in breeding important staple food crops. And then through the next generation cassava breeding project, we'll hear about how leading edge work led by CALS in collaboration with African partners is positively impacting some of the world's poorest farmers and consumers, those in sub-Saharan Africa for whom cassava is a daily staple. <coughs> Finally, We'll hear about how efforts to enhance nutrition in the poorest parts of India by the Tata Cornell Institute for Agriculture and Nutrition improve household nutrition while providing life-changing experiences for Cal students engaged in the work funded by Cornell alumnus Ratan Tata. All, an important sub-theme that you'll recognize across all of these different <coughs> projects is the importance of visionary investment by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Department for International Development of the UK, the Tata Foundation, and others. Climate change, insects, and diseases know no boundaries. They threaten the world's <coughs> health and food supply. So listen up as we give you some examples of how a fully engaged Cornell builds transboundary coalitions that bring together leading edge scientists, students, philanthropists, and international collaborators to pursue and institute knowledge for public good. So to kick us off today, I'd like to introduce you to Kelly Robbins, who is a quantitative geneticist and assistant professor in the School of Integrative Plant Sciences in CALS. His research focuses on the effective use of diverse genetic resources by applying high throughput technologies and remote sensing. He's focused on the improvement of genetic gains of breeding programs in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. 
The Genomic Open Source Breeding Informatics Initiative, or GOBI, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and about which he will speak today, is working with the International Rice Research Institute, or ERI, the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, CIMIT, and the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, or ICRASAT, to integrate genomic information into routine breeding decisions. The Excellence in Breeding Platform works with CGIR breeding programs, those cent international centers, to improve breeding efficiency through the development and adoption of state-of-the-art genomic, phenotyping, and computational tools. So today, Kelly will share with us how he's bringing this leading-edge Cornell research to the world through the work of the collaborations with these CGIR centers. Welcome, Kelly. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that great introduction, and thank you for having me here today. So. Um, as mentioned, uh, a lot of the, the research that I do here at Cornell is uh, in partnership with the CGIR. This is an international consortium of uh, agricultural research institutes. Uh, you can see they're, they're spread throughout the world, um, and a lot of these uh, institutes are really targeting uh, genetic improvement uh, in developing nations. You can see the vision is a world free of poverty, hunger, and environmental degradation. As mentioned before, we have a lot of challenges facing us in terms of being able to feed a growing population. So by 2050, the population of the world is going to be over 9 billion, and most of this growth will occur in developing nations. And so these really are where the CGIR breeding programs are on the front line in terms of being able to deliver the improvements in the rate of genetic gains that we're going to have to achieve to be able to continue to feed the population sustainably. So I don't want to get too much into to plant breeding and genetics. Uh, I'm a quantitative geneticist, so I, I do have to put at least one equation in my presentations. But uh, this is really just to illustrate that at, at a very high level, most breeding programs are the same. Uh, so you're going to identify superior plant genetics, so these lines carrying superior genes. You're going to cross them. You generate new lines. You then screen those lines for superior genotypes, and you recycle. The rate of genetic gain that you get in these breeding programs are really a factor of just a few things. One is the intensity of selection you place on the lines, the speed at which you uh, continue the process, so cycle the process, and then the amount of genetic diversity that you're screening is part of this. Most breeding programs have been very highly optimized around this equation for response here. And in the absence of uh, disruptive technologies, really the only effective way to improve genetic gains is to Im increase the size of your breeding program. Now this comes with a, a substantial investment uh, to be able to do this, and this really isn't an option for a lot of these breeding programs in the developing world. Fortunately, we are in an era right now in science where we have very disruptive technologies in the area of digital agriculture coming. Um, we're able to generate phenotypic information through remote sensing, through robotics, through drones. We're able to identify and, and uh, genotype uh, superior genetics using technologies such as uh, next generation sequencing and RNA-seq. And this type of data really has the potential to change the way in which we do breeding. The problem here is that these types of data sets are very difficult to work with. And a lot of the breeding programs that we work with in the developing world simply do not have the, the infrastructure set up to be able to adopt these types of technologies in their breeding programs. So it really requires us to change the way in which we think about how breeding is done in these breeding programs in the developing world. So we have uh, several projects happening here at Cornell um, in partnership with the Boyce Thompson Institute, the USDA, CGIR, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They're really focusing on figuring out how we can take these breeding programs in the developing world and build the type of infrastructure and expertise to be able to incorporate these modern technologies and improve the rates of genetic gains in, in these countries. So the projects that I work on, uh, the GOBI and Excellence in Breeding, as mentioned before, are really about taking each of these breeding programs and, and rebuilding them from the ground up to be more efficient and obtain the types of uh, yield increases and rates of genetic gain that we're going to have to have to be able to feed a growing population. So we're focusing on the data modeling aspect, so how do we take all of this uh, high dimensional raw data and turn this into information that breeders can use to make the right decisions, the type of computational infrastructure you need to have. When we're talking about breeding, you're talking about making decisions in very tight windows of time, and so being able to get the right data to the right people at the right time is incredibly challenging. 
We're looking at breeding systems optimization, uh, technology development, and obviously training is a huge part of what we do here. We have training sessions around the world yearly uh, to be able to uh, equip the people working in these programs with the knowledge they need to carry the work forward. Um, these are long-term projects and uh, as you might guess, being able to rebuild some of these programs will take some time, but we're making good progress and uh, we're looking forward to uh, future developments in this area. So our next speaker, uh, Jean-Luc Janik, is, um, his work is an excellent example of how the leading edge kind of work, um, upstream uh, computational work that Kelly just mentioned is actually having impact um, on the lives of farmers in, in remote areas of sub-Saharan Africa. John Luke is a research plant geneticist with the United States Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service, and he's also an adjunct professor in the Department of, a section of plant breeding and genetics in the School of Integrated Plant Sciences at Cornell. He obtained a PhD in plant breeding with a minor in sustainable agriculture from the University of Minnesota in 1999, and his research focuses on statistical approaches to analyze and interpret the increasing quantity of DNA data available to breeding programs in combination with the phenotypic diversity these programs traditionally excel at putting to use. And his goal is to enable programs to make those better breeding decisions um, more rapidly. Thanks, thanks Sarah. <clears throat> um, yeah, thanks for that introduction. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's see. Right, so there are essentially two kernels to my talk. One is about indeed going from um, these very upstream breeding uh, research projects to something applied, something where we deliver a product to farmers, um, the kinds of research projects that abound here at Cornell. And the other is about engaging with the public, or in, in this case, engaging with farmers, um, to make sure that our products go that final mile, that they are adopted by the farmers. <clears throat> so it's on cassava. Uh, it's not a common crop in the United States, of course, but it is actually, it feeds hundreds of millions of people um, in sub-Saharan Africa. It's also primarily grown by small farmers, so it's very important for their livelihoods. Furthermore, with um, the climate challenges that we're facing nowadays, we think it'll play an important role. It has a number of drought tolerance mechanisms, and it does well under low fertility. Uh, the problem with it is illustrated by this relatively old review, but it still holds today. Namely, while more and more, I can hardly see this, cassava is being grown globally, um, the yields have stagnated, so the yield levels are flattened. And uh, this holds true today, too. Uh, in, in Southeast Asia, you have some increases in yield, but essentially in Africa, um, yield levels are relatively flat. And this is not something that we would normally expect. With plant breeding, we're, we're generally able to bend that yield curve upward. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm going to flesh out a little bit what um, Kelly said to you about, about how breeding works. Uh, generally, you have a breeding target, and then you have a base population of varieties. Most of the varieties are average. You have some exceptional ones. You identify them by evaluation, you select them, and you cross them. That creates a new, a new population, a new distribution of uh, performance. And uh, you, again, have to evaluate them, cross them, and propagate them, and so on, until far from being completely impossible, um, your breeding target becomes essentially inevitable. And this has been done uh, many times in the developed world, <coughs> um, as, as contrasted to the case of cassava that I was showing to you. So the, the trick there is how fast can we move this? How fast can we go from this distribution of individuals or varieties to that distribution? These are the steps. You evaluate, you identify the best ones, you select them, you cross them. Then you start with just a few <coughs> seed, or in the case of cassava, um, a few cuttings, because cassava is clonally propagated. Uh, and once you've uh, advanced those materials, you have more seeds, more, more cuttings, you're able to evaluate them again. So the, the really the rate limiting steps, the, the parts of this cycle that take a long time, are these two, the propagation and evaluation. So what if you could just skip them? Uh, what if you could just do the fast parts of the cycle, right? That would really greatly accelerate uh, your breeding progress. And so this is what, you, what we can do with genomic selection, all right? So, so rather than the extensive, long-lasting um, propagation evaluation, we essentially sample DNA from the new uh, variety candidates. We develop predictive models to identify which ones w are going to work well and which ones won't. We take the ones that we believe are going to work well, we cross them, and we start again. It can be very rapid. 
this is the, the sort of basic research component of this, um, the, the, the genomic parts. And I won't really tell you more about that, but essentially it's about accelerating that breeding cycle. So we have uh, a problem, stagnant yield levels, we have a potential solution. Uh, and this is where um, the sort of the origin story of the, the Next Gen Cassava project starts with um, so forward-looking uh, funding agencies, the UK Department for International Development, the Gates Foundation. They come to Cornell, they say, hey, you guys know about this genomic selection, you, you know, we've, we've published on it. Uh, can, can you develop a project to apply it to cassava? They help us identify partners in Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, just to name them, the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture in Nigeria, it's one of these uh, crop research, international crop research centers that Kelly mentioned. The National Root Crop Research Institute, which is the national program in Nigeria. Uh, in Uganda, the National Crop Resources Research Institute, and in Tanzania, the Lake Zone Agricultural Development uh, Institute, which is up by Lake Victoria in Mwanza. Um, we bring those together with a number of international partners. As Sarah mentioned, I myself represent the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service. Uh, we also partner with the Boyce Thompson Institute just up the way on campus. They've done a lot of bioinformatics and database work for us. <laughs> Sequencing has come from the Joint Genome Institute. Turns out cassava was domesticated in Latin America, so the best germplasm, the most diverse germplasm, is actually in Colombia, at Seat, and in Brazil with Embrapa. Um, so we've brought this all together in a, in a big project to try to implement this genomic selection in cassava. Okay, so I'm a data scientist. I wouldn't be happy if I didn't show you at least one data slide. Uh, here it is. Um, each dot represents a variety. Uh, the red dots are varieties that are leased, that are available to farmers. The x-axis shows how much they yield in fresh root yield. And then the y-axis is the dry matter content. So a cassava root, it has water in it and it has solids. The more solids you have in that, in that cassava root, the more food you can actually make out of a given amount of root. So we've identified uh, from our, our um, variety candidates, those that produce the most gari, which is a sort of roasted uh, cassava project, and fufu, which is a boiled cassava product, product um, those that create the most. So basically, I think I'm, I, I'm telling you here, it's working, right? We, um, we have uh, variety candidates that produce more yield per, per unit area, and especially more, uh, more food, so there's a sort of food yield aspect, more food per uh, amount of root. The question is, do farmers want these varieties? And this is where we need to, to um, do some public engagement. In our case, it means farmer engagement. Um, I've shown you that we know how to breed. Once we've decided which direction we want to breed, <coughs> in, we can move our, our varieties in that direction. We want to make sure we know what to breed for, that, that we develop varieties that farmers really want. Uh, so we need to engage with these farmers. The farmers are the decision makers, after all. Um, and in particular, I want to highlight that we need to work with women equally as with men. Uh, in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, these smallholder farmers, uh, much of the farming is done by women. They do a lot of the food processing. They really are decision makers on, on what um, um, varieties will be adopted. So our motto is to take it to the farmer and indeed engage with these groups, figure out what it is they want so that we can use our technologies to get them there. So we talk a lot about uh, the importance of partnerships, and our next speaker, Maricelis Acevedo, is um, going to share with us uh, a, a remarkable example of how Cornell has led a, a large global coalition to solve um, a, a pressing problem that wheat, our <coughs> global wheat crop, uh, faces. So Maricelis is uh, the Associate Director for Science of the Delivering Genetic Gain in Wheat Project, and she is um, in international programs in CALS. She works side by side by wheat scientists around the world to develop and deliver wheat varieties that are high yielding and disease resistant. She also contributes to the wheat breeding and pathology capacities of national programs in Ethiopia, Kenya, and across South Asia. She provides research infrastructure, training opportunities for junior scientists, and is a remarkable uh, inspiration for young women working in wheat. Prior to joining Cornell, Maricelis was a serial rust pathologist and assistant professor at North Dakota State University in Fargo. She obtained her Bachelor's of um, Science and her Master's of Science in Puerto Rico, and she earned her PhD in biology with a specialization in plant pathology from the University of Nebraska. 
She was a postdoctoral fellow at the USDA ARS Potato and Small Grains Research Unit in Aberdeen, Idaho. And in 2010, she was among the first recipients of the Jeannie Borlaug Lobby <coughs> Women in Triticum Early Career Award. Maricelis originally comes from Puerto Rico, where her family still lives on a small farm on the northwest side of the island, and where Maricelis was just spending uh, the last few weeks helping uh, the, the, the efforts there. Welcome, Maricelis. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's a real honor for me to be here uh, communicating to you what we have been doing on wheat research here at Cornell, leading uh, this international coalition. It's a great story. I, uh, um, as you heard, I'm a plant pathologist and rust pathologist specifically, working in wheat for many years. And I was uh, completely fascinated when I heard about the initial stages of this project since 2008. Um, since 2008, uh, Cornell, uh, through international programs, has led this coalition of scientists over in 22 institutions, over 700 scientists come together to protect wheat. Initially, it was to protect wheat against UG99, that is a strain of the stem rust pathogen that uh, it started in Uganda in 1998, and it had the potential at that point to destroy over 80% of the wheat of the world because it was they were susceptible to this, not only in the developing country, but also in, in developed countries like the U.S. and, and U.K. So Dr. Norman Borlaug sounded the alarm, the father of the Green Revolution, who started working on stem rust himself, sounded the alarm to the scientists, to the community, and to donors like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the UK Department of International Development about the importance of, of this project and the, the threat that this uh, disease could have for uh, the food security of the world, especially in developing countries. Um, this initiative was led by, is led by Ronnie Kaufman, Dr. Ronnie Kaufman, uh, an international program, was Dr. Norman Borlaug's uh, PhD student, and he understood the threat that Restem Rust caused to the world. So he decided to reach out to scientists around the world and build this coalition. In the first phase of this project um, from 2008, uh, over 80 varieties were developed, and the idea was to develop varieties of wheat that were resistant to this disease and put it in at-risk countries, uh, put it in the hands of smallholder farmers like Makita uh, Mohammed in Ethiopia, whose uh, wheat fields were destroyed because of rust. And the idea is to provide a better uh, food security, but also better livelihood, especially for smallholder farmers in Ethiopia, in East Africa, in Central and South Asia. Thanks to the varieties that were released, for example, in Makina, her children and herself had a better livelihood. So with the scientists at Cornell and international centers like been mentioned in uh, CIMIT and in ECARDA and others, uh, we've been able to reach out to all these farmers. In addition to develop these varieties, we were able to train scientists, junior scientists around the world that then can take on all this information, all these techniques or these skills. Some of the same uh, uh, technologies that John Luke and Kelly have mentioned, we put it into practice, into wheat var developing wheat varieties uh, for the world. But in addition to have stem rust as a problem, and I can talk to you for hours about stem rust because that's, that's my passion. Like we all have our little uh, pet project. But we know that beyond rust, there's many, many threats uh, to wheat. <coughs> and climate change, especially heat, and night temperatures uh, can affect wheat yields uh, in immensely. It is estimated that with one temperature rise at night, wheat will lose up to 10% of, of its yield. So we know we have already some food insecurity and malnutrition around the world. And, w and wheat provides 20% of the calories and the proteins around the world. So if we're going to continue losing uh, this yield that is so needed and we need to feed over 9 billion people, we, are a lot, we have a lot to do. So that project that started just working on developing resistant varieties for stem rust resistant, then grew up into a new project called Delivering Genetic Gaining Wheat. 
<coughs> so from durable rust resistant to delivering genetic gain to produce a full packet that can not only be uh, resistant to diseases but also climate resilient. And so this is where we are right now. We have the threat of diseases. Now we have to look at producing more wheat with water, nutrient, and energy scarcity. And we have climate change and all of the, the challenges. So we think uh, during our Borla Global Rust Initiative, that is this coalition um, of scientists, we think that we can provide the demands of wheat that the world needs by 2050 by putting agronomy, investment in agronomy, and breeding practices, bringing all these sciences uh, and technologies together to produce these varieties and feed the world. So our current project, that is the one I, I lead since 2016, has multiple uh, objectives. This is how we set up our goals. And we work <coughs> on continue surveillance and monitoring of the pathogen, like the rust pathogens. And then we use this information to guide our breeding technologies. We use uh, new technologies like genomic selection and high throughput phenotyping. And all this data then is generated and used to breed better uh, wheat varieties. We put these varieties in nurseries around the world, what we call our phenotyping platforms, and we evaluate them for resistance to diseases and to abiotic stresses like heat and drought. Um, we also uh, push for multiplication of these varieties to replace the varieties that the farmers are growing, like John Luke was saying, if the farmers don't take these new varieties, all this technology goes, goes nowhere, because we need to engage the farmers. So we make sure that these varieties, they are produced and into the hands of the farmers. Uh, in addition to the scientific aspect, we dedicate uh, resources to two additional areas. One is advocacy, because like I'm doing here, t talking to you, getting the public to understand the challenges that we have and how science can help solve these problems. Uh, we need to do more and more of that, not only with the public, with the governments, with uh, the uh, the policy makers. And then we have to train the next generation of scientists. So we dedicate a lot of our efforts into talent pipelines. And this requires training of junior scientists in science, but not only science, also leadership and uh, better uh, interdisciplinary skills, uh, statistics, how to communicate effectively, uh, gender awareness uh, in research. So we know that we are reaching out to all our farmers. <coughs> And just to show you, this is where we are right now. Over 22 institutions uh, are in the particular project, but our Borla Global Ross Initiative reach out around the world. And uh, we have a beautiful connection of, of scientists that not only engage within the institution or within the country, but across the country, across discipline. Uh, our students benefit from this engagement because they can go to the fields of the world and, and really understand how the science is put into practice in the field and communicate with scientists in other areas. So our fourth and final speaker today is um, Prabhu Kangali, and he's the founding director of the Tata Cornell Institute and is a professor in the Charles H. Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management. He has a joint appointment in the Division of Nutritional Sciences in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Prior to moving to Ithaca in June of 2013, he was Deputy Director of Agricultural Development Division of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, from 2008 to 2013. Uh, Prabhu was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences as a Foreign Fellow in May of 2007 and he was the president of the International Association of Agricultural Economists from 2003 and 2006. And in his talk today, Prabhu will, among other um, aspects, share how the Tata Cornell Initiative has offered Cornell PhD students and uh, scholarly endeavors uh, that are really addressing real world problems. Thanks. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here and to talk to you all about the Tata Cornell program. Um, the Tata Cornell Institute for Agriculture and Nutrition was set up um, around um, 2012 
and it was set up with a very generous endowment that was given by the Tata Trust uh, through uh, Mr. Ratan Tata, who is an alumnus of Cornell from, I think, 1957 or so in architecture. And Mr. Tata, as many of you know, uh, chairs the Tata Group, which is a, a major industrial complex in India. Um, one of the, the, the main focus areas for our program here at Cornell is to try and understand why India, which is growing rapidly, growing at the rate of 7% per annum in, in GDP, continues to have the largest number of poor people in the world and to have the largest number of malnourished people in the world, and all of them living primarily in rural areas. And what's the role of agriculture in addressing this problem? So in our institute, we've taken a multidisciplinary approach to this problem. We're looking at the role of technologies, looking at ways in which agriculture productivity for smallholder agriculture can help improve the livelihoods of farmers, improve their incomes, improve their access to food, etc. But we're also looking at ways in which we can improve the nutrition supply in the food system itself. How can we enhance the overall food supply systems to go from a focus that's been predominantly on staple grains, such as rice and wheat, to more diversified production systems, and also looking at ways in which we can enhance the nutritive value of the staples themselves, uh, the biofortification, et cetera. In addition to that, we've been trying to look at uh, what are the factors that, change, that cause people not to improve their diets? Why do people, even if they know that one can have better, uh, better diets, don't tend to consume better diets? What are the behavioral factors that affect that? and looking at behavioral change as part of what we do. And finally, we're looking at the role of sanitation, clean drinking water, et cetera, in helping the body absorb the food, absorb the nutrients, and convert that into better health. We've got a range of PhD research projects going on across the country. Um, but I, I have time just to give you a flavor of the type of work that we're doing. So let me start with one of our oldest projects here. The, our, one of our very first projects was started by a group of water engineers at Cornell um, with a group called Agua Clara. And this group has designed a technology for delivering clean drinking water to rural areas. They've been working in Honduras. They've worked um, in four <coughs> villages in India. And what this group has been doing is to combine solar power and gravity power uh, in order to deliver water from wells, from groundwater systems, and bring that up into this tank up here. And in the tank, there's a, uh, there are two filters. There's a sand filter, and then there's a chemical filter that filters the water, brings it into a holding tank, and from there, through gravity, gets that water and pipes it into every single house within the village. We've built about four of these systems in four villages. And four villages in India have clean drinking water, which we tested recently. And that water is at 98% US EPA standards. That's, that water is cleaner than the water that we take into the village in these sorts of bottles that we carry with us. And, and villages in these um, uh, in these uh, villages are now paying about 60 rupees per month in order to get <coughs> two hours of clean drinking water supply piped into their houses. That's about a dollar per month that they're paying in to be able to get the service. And this, this, this service has been operational now for two years. And it's turning out to be a fairly sustainable system that's moving forward. Here's another project that we started. In several areas, r remote rural areas, there's a real serious problem of access to micronutrients. Iron, zinc, uh, vitamin B, folic acid, etc. Now, if you live in any urban city, you can get fortified flour. 
you can get fortified milk, etc. But taking industrial, industrialized fortified food into rural areas is a big challenge. So what we've done is to look at creating opportunities for fortification in villages themselves. So we've combined our forces with DSM, which is a big micronutrient manufacturing company, and we came up with these sachets. These sachets, uh, which contain micronutrients, they contain iron, folic acid, vitamin B12, and vitamin A. And each of these sachets can be used to fortify about 15 kilograms of wheat or 15 kilograms of rice flour. So the village households buy these sachets at three rupees per sachet. That's about five cents per sachet. And they take the sachet <coughs> along with their wheat grain to the mill, the local mill, get the grain milled, and combine that with the fortification. So with 15 kg, you get about half a month's worth of fortified wheat flour that you can bring back to your house. For two of these sachets, for 10 cents a month, you've got fortified wheat flour for the entire family of five people. And, and this fortified flour can be done right in the village. And, and you have rural women entrepreneurs who go around house to house selling these sachets and providing these monthly supply of sachets. This project has been going on for two years and we are now expanding beyond the first 10 villages to 30 villages in Gujarat state and in India. Mycotoxins are a big problem in terms of food safety. And many of you know that aflatoxin problems and other mycotoxin problems have been seen in crops such as corn and peanuts. And one of our PhD students in plant sciences Anthony Wendt has been spending a year in India looking at the problem of mycotoxin uh, risks in the Indian food systems. And what he found was, yes, you do see high levels of aflatoxin in corn and in peanuts, but surprisingly, you're also beginning to see mycotoxin problems in rice, in wheat, and in several other commonly consumed food. Not at the same high levels that you may see in, in corn, but even at low levels, but with constant consumption of these commodities and large quantities of these commodities consumed, you find that the Indian <coughs> population, in Indian rural population, is facing a, a chronic risk of high levels of aflatoxin contamination. Uh, that over, pro over prolonged periods can be extremely risky. So what Anthony is doing right now in India is assessing the extent of the problem and looking at ways in which one can improve rural storage systems at the household level in order to reduce the risk associated with mycotoxin contamination. This is his PhD thesis. He'll be back here by next summer, and by then he would have worked in eight districts in India, trying to figure out new mechanisms for storage in order to reduce the risk of mycotoxin. Some of you have heard about the work of biofortification. Biofortification is a way in which you enhance crops by enhancing the nutrient value of these crops. This is a big global project done by a group called Harvest Plus <coughs> which is part of that international agriculture research system that was mentioned earlier. Now, one of the crops that's been biofortified is sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes that have been enhanced with vitamin A. Vitamin A rich sweet, sweet potatoes, and they're called orange flesh sweet potato. They turn, they turn orange, and they're very high in vitamin A. One of the, the people behind this work is a lady called Jan Lowe. Jan Lowe is an alumnus of Cornell uh, from, I forgot which year, 10, 20 years ago, <laughs> 20 years ago maybe. And last year she won the World Food Prize along with some of her colleagues for this work on orange flesh sweet potato. What one of our nutrition PhD students 
has taken this material, this sweet potato, to India. Now in India, sweet potato is not a very common crop. Sweet potato is more a snack rather than a food. But she's taken the sweet potato to India and she's looking at areas where potatoes are grown normally and trying to introduce sweet potato into those farming systems and see whether one can enhance those farming systems by bringing sweet potato into it, vitamin A rich sweet potato. Then promoting the consumption of this crop creating behavior change modules, creating dramas and theater, etc., to get people used to consuming sweet potato. <coughs> and she's looking at developing recipes for baby food, for babies that are beyond six months as they get into complementary feeding, to bring this uh, vitamin A rich sweet potato into their feeding uh, uh, practices. And then doing an overall assessment of what's happening to the vitamin A status of this population, especially the mother and the child. Katie is in northern Uttar Pradesh right now, and she'll be back also by next fall. And by that time, she would have spent the year looking at the feasibility of growing the sweet potato crop, looking at ways in which you can promote its consumption, and coming up with recipes for baby food and promoting that, and looking at some of these pilots in terms of the <coughs> impact it's had on vitamin A status of that population. A quick look at the members of the Tata Cornell Institute. We now have about 13 PhD students. Our sustainable capacity will bring us to about 16 PhD students. We're looking at bringing in four students each year and graduating four students each year. Uh, our program cuts across campus. We've got PhD students in plant sciences, animal sciences, nutrition, applied economics, sociology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of our students spend a year in the field, a year in rural India. And all of our students use that year in India to do their PhD thesis work and then come back and get their thesis here. We also have several postdoctoral fellows and research associates in, in the program. What I'm particularly <laughs> proud of is that we've got a, a very large share of our students as young women coming both from India and from the US focused on getting their PhDs in this area and focused on PhDs that make a difference to people's lives. Thank you. Maricel, um, I, I want to start with you. Um, you mentioned briefly, but perhaps you can talk a little bit more about um, how these global coalitions like the G DGGW project build human capacity, and why is it that donors like the UK Department for International Development and the Gates Foundation are interested in investing in human capacity? Thank you, Sarah. Um, that's one of the areas that I'm, I'm more passionate about our project. Um, I mentioned to you all the research work we're doing, we're developing these uh, wheat varieties, but I think one of the aspects of the project that makes it so unique is the investment in human capacity building. It's training opportunities for junior scientists, building uh, skills uh, to these national programs. Because the idea is that we want to strengthen the national programs like in Ethiopia, in Bangladesh, in India, in Kenya. We want them to be partners in agriculture, uh, but succeed as partners, um, succeed as scientists, reach out to the, all the opportunities that are in the world. By universities like, in, in academic institutions like Cornell, reaching out to the world and building that capacity, we are engaging in what we do best, that is uh, training opportunities, bringing knowledge, and knowledge that actually has an uh, impact in the world and the livelihood of others. Uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the UK uh, Department for International Development really engage with us in those activities because they can see that it's an investment, an investment not only in today but in the future, um, because 
Now they can do the research. They can also provide their own innovations, their own opportunities for the countries and for the global community. So I think it's a win-win situation. And I, we have so many great stories of scientists that started with some of our training, some of our input, some of our awards, and now are there, are, have their own research programs in the countries. They are leading in many international institutions. So it is, it is a fabulous opportunity to really take these resources and put it out to the world and continue the Cornell mission uh, in the world. So, Jean-Luc, keeping with this theme of capacity building, the Next Gen Cassava Project also has a huge capacity building element, and you're really investing in these national programs in Nigeria and Uganda. But how do you ensure that this is self-sustaining and that ultimately you won't be dependent on philanthropic gifts to, to keep those breeding programs going? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think uh, some of it has to do with um, once the level of ex excellence has been increased, um, making sure that the governments of, the, of these countries realize what, they, what their institutions can do and that the, the investments continue from, uh, from the governments. I think, too, um, okay, so we're, we're, we're developing a product, right? We're developing uh, cassava, new cassava varieties. Uh, at some point, these cassava varieties enter into um, the seed system. They can be uh, sold commercially. So there, there is um, a way that, that this can be converted into, um, you know, a commercial development. So, <coughs> Kelly, you're also working with breeding programs in uh, less developed countries. What are some of the constraints and challenges that you're facing in bringing your leading edge science to those breeding programs? Yeah, so um, the way a lot of these programs uh, have been set up, both I think because of the organization of the, of the CGR as well as just the resource constraints that they work with, they, they tend to operate very independently. So what you have is when doing breeding, you have to make decisions in a very short amount of time. It's just the biology of the crop you're working with. From the time you actually get data to make a decision to the time you can make that decision, you have a very short window in which to operate. And because of this, these breeding programs are really built around uh, using data, using information, using techniques that a single breeder as well as their support staff could, could do to be able to, to make these decisions. And so a lot of the, the infrastructure that you would need to operate more efficiently, so if, if you take larger breeding type of programs to be able to do the type of data management, to have the type of computational infrastructure in place, to be able to uh, incorporate higher density data sets uh, is just non-existent. And so one of the challenges we have is, is one, changing the mindset away from saying, um, you know, the information that you're collecting right now is important to make these decisions, but there's also a lot of other very valuable information out there that we can bring into the decision-making process. So part of it's just changing the mindset. The other part is sort of building this foundation in terms of the computational infrastructure that you have to have in place. And doing that in, in sometimes very challenging parts of the world can be uh, uh, very difficult. Thanks. So, Prabhu, coming back to this theme of capacity building, um, your, your project is unique in that you're really investing in Cornell students and, and their meaningful engagement out there in the world. So how, in your program, how do you balance the, um, the challenge of providing them meaningful opportunities out there in the world where they're really poised to make a difference with the academic rigor uh, associated with being at an Ivy League institution? Um, that's a real big challenge. I mean, when, when I first came into this uh, program, my challenge was not the students, my challenge was the faculty. <laughs> because most faculty could not comprehend doing field-based PhD research, because they didn't think that field-based research is compatible with rigor uh, of a PhD program. They were more comfortable with lab-based programs <coughs> or modeling and data work done at Cornell. Uh, but we were able to show, with our very first PhD uh, uh, student who ended up winning a big international award for a PhD, uh, that helped us a lot because that <laughs> then changed the way people looked at us. But I keep telling people the rigor is the same, whether you're doing uh, an experiment in the lab or you're doing the experiment in the field. The rigor with, by which um, you identify the problem by which you identify what the research question is, 
and the way you define your hypothesis, the way you define your methodology for addressing this hypothesis or testing it, and then the rigor with which you do the analysis, the peer review process for making sure that that you've done everything right and you're at international standards, and then getting it published in major peer-reviewed journals. These are all the same processes. And, but the added bonus is you, you get students who've actually spent a year working in rural India. And for, for students, whether they're American students, Indian students, or from anywhere else in the world, this is a life-changing opportunity because they come back after this one year in the field and, and basically they can spend the rest of their career talking about international development saying, hey, I've been there, I've done this, I know what it's all about. And that's a very empowering feeling. And I'm really happy that we've got more than enough supply of students who are willing to do that. Ag school a long time ago, Gene Rowley. Uh, across every one of your co uh, conversations, it seemed to me, scalability of putting this in action in the field is not part of the study. Uh, that's the outcome. And when I read in the paper about can't get, can't have the economics to buy the seed, can't get the fertilizer, we don't have the water, in a, in a number of different areas, and this in particular, in Africa, perhaps. But um, so, what about the scalability, the application, and therefore, therefore, see the benefit, a uh, longer range of the scientific work that you folks have done. Great scalability. We'll hold that thought, and we'll come over here. Um, it's not talking about any interactions with development banks in terms of what you do, because you know, you're front end and research, and then looking at how it might be applied in the field. Great. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask John Luke, sort of what factors determine the farmer's receptivity to the new varieties of cassava, and what are you or others doing to uh, affect their decisions? Yeah, I think that's also a question Marcel could speak to. So um, why don't each of you uh, choose one of those uh, questions or comments that you'd like to, to respond to? We'll start with you, John. Um, well, so I'll, I'll try to hit two, two parts. One is this, the scalability question. So, uh, so far we've had two phases of this next-gen cassava project. We're actually right between the two phases, but the first phase was really this basic research. Can genomic selection work with cassava? And then, then when the Gates Foundation came back to us with, with DFID, they, they really wanted us to develop cassava varieties and release them to farmers. So it's very much more applied than the first phase. And, and you can imagine that transitioning from there to, uh, okay, how do we prepare this as a package to be released commercially? I mean, why not? And so then it would be up to the commercial sector to scale, and I think that's what they're good at. Um, on the question of, of farmers, so we, you know, we're working in a number of different ways. This is really part of the second phase, this is transition. Uh, but, but we have some traditional surveys, we have one thing you want to do with farmers is uh, make them recognize the biological constraints that you're operating within. So, so if you just lay out a bunch of different possibilities and traits, they'll just tell you they want them all, right? Improve the yield, improve dry matter content, better taste, and so on. But, but so you need to tell them, okay, so you can have this much more resistance in this variety, but that variety that has more resistance, it'll have somewhat less yield. Or you can have so you, so you identify these constraints and you and you give them questions along those lines. And then the final point that I think is important, uh, maybe relates <coughs> to scalability too, is we want to do a lot of farmer participatory evaluation. So uh, we'll we'll bring these varieties out to farmers uh, to, to as many as possible. Give them very simple comparisons among three varieties. Allow them to tell us which ones they they like best. <coughs> We'll get a direct uh, farmer preference ranking of these different varieties that will allow us to correlate that farmer preference ranking to things that we can measure on station. And actually, it'll also allow us, well, one of the things that's nice about a clonal, clonally propagated crop is, in some ways, it scales by itself, right? If a farmer likes a variety, they can clone it out and, and, and give it to their, um, to their neighbors. It's not exactly what you're you're asking for, I think, but but it we're going to um, basically measure adoption rates among among our different varieties. Marcel, do you want to address that farmer adoption question? 
Yeah, um, so we work with national programs and international centers. So through our uh, partnership with different academic and research institutions, we help on the development of these varieties and or these lines. And then these lines are taken into the national programs. The national programs evaluate them on the ground. They understand the cultural behavior, what the farmers are looking for. And then we also, uh, once these varieties have been selected by the local uh, breeders in, in collaboration with the, with the local institutions, we pass it on into field days to farmers, so they get to see it in the field. They can look at them, they can look at the benefit. We also educate them about, uh, for example, with rust, you don't need to be spraying for rust if you see only 5% of rust, it's okay. These varieties can handle it because they produce, so, they have so much better yield, the resistance that they have in the package is so much better. You don't have to be afraid of seeing a little bit of rust, doesn't have to be clean. So educating them about the behavior of the new varieties and understanding what, it, what are the farmers looking for in Ethiopia. They want a specific a stature of the, of the plant. We cannot be like the really short ones that we uh, like, for example, in the US because they also use the straw. So understanding mm -hmm. the cultural cultural behavior and working with the local uh, scientists to that understand that that behavior I think is key and then uh, in terms of scalability, scalability um, we work on seed system for multiplication of seed at the local level we work with government institutions because they have to take it they have to take ownership there's that we go so far and then <coughs> we want to strengthen their capacity so they can take into the next level because there's uh, challenges on the of where we can take a, a project a particular project we are in uh, sometimes in the business of developing this new knowledge new technologies I, I said that our wheat fields are like the best classroom and laboratory in the world because these fields is where we test new technologies new varieties uh, innovate uh, think about new solutions by these collaborations and then the national programs need to come in as a partner and see how it fits with their strategy. For example, in Ethiopia, they're looking at commercialization and modernization of agriculture. So now they want to take what we are doing and say, how does it fit with what the country's doing with the other investments and fit it in within the system? We could probably do more in the future, but right now we are responding to the, the actual challenges that we're having and then passing it on um, working with the national programs. Okay, thanks. Kelly, any thoughts on scale? Yeah, I, I, very valid points. I mean, uh, some of the projects that, that we work on, at least that I'm working on, are a little bit more upstream. So it, it's, it's more about how do we improve uh, the performance of the plants themselves. Of course, this, this can't happen without uh, more of the downstream work, which is, you know, how do you get this seed to the farmers? How do you get them what they need to, to get the, the optimal yield out of these? And, and so these projects typically pair up. And so uh, the, the breeding programs we work with uh, partner very closely with national agricultural programs, and they also partner very closely with private seed companies within these geographies. And so uh, the lead material that comes out of these breeding programs is then uh, handed off uh, to these companies. These companies themselves would do a lot of the seed production. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been uh, done with using seed coatings and things like that. So you're actually, the, the, the farmers are, are getting seeds with fertis, uh, fertilizers and pesticides already coated on the seeds to help them uh, get off to a good start and, and early vigor in the growing process. So it, it takes both and, and that work is happening. With breeding, you can't necessarily wait for the downstream to always work itself out because with breeding you have anywhere from a seven to ten year lag time from when you really start to do something to when you drive it into uh, adoption or, or widespread adoption. So you have to be very forward looking on the breeding end and then obviously constantly working on, on the downstream with partners to, to make sure that you know some of these other issues are taken care of. Probably you knew we were going to save that bank question for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll also combine it with scalability. Sounds great. So to give you some examples of scalability from our work, um, the government of India, through World Bank support, is trying to expand rural drinking water systems across northern India. So they've now covered, covering about six states. And some of the people involved in that work came out to the site where we were working in Jharkhand, looked at the projects we were doing. And what they found, because they were already putting up the tanks and all that, so what they wanted was 
the chemical doser system that Cornell had developed. They said, if you can get this component and provide us that, then we can scale that on all of our water tanks. So that was a real quick, easy win, because the bank had already given them the money. They were already moving forward. They saw something that was working, and they said, let's move with it. Um, in that micronutrient work that we're doing uh, with the sachets, the, the company that provided us the initial set of sachets now sees this as a big market and then sees this as a way to move forward. So it, it, it always comes down to who the partners are and what's happening on the ground at that point. There's a lot of interest today in, in India on nutrition issues, on sanitation, on clean drinking water. So all, to the extent that we as Cornell can provide answers, there's a, a rapid adoption of that material. So we're kind of fortunate that, in that respect. Um, I just had a, uh, some more to add. Thank you very much for your example, particularly from India. Um, I spent the last month in Saudi Arabia, actually, on a business project. So I'm not so familiar with the areas. And it happened to be uh, <coughs> it was an HR project for the Islamic Development Bank. And I had to interview 80 people because they were organizing. And through the discussions, it was fascinating for me because it's about a lot of development to work, about seed, about soil. Um, they're involved a lot with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as Jeffrey Sachs at the Earth Institute of Columbia. And I wonder how come they don't have any interaction with Cornell, because Cornell is great at seed and agriculture. And so I, I guess that's why I'm trying to understand where does that linkage <coughs> come in with the development banks, because the Islamic Development Bank is made of 57 member countries, with a focus on Islamic countries, but you know, not so much focus on religion, but on developmental work in many of the countries that you've mentioned, Ethiopia, Cote d'Ivoire, very poor countries, and it seemed like there would be good synergies. And I just wonder how does the school link up with you know, those pieces of development bank, which gets things into the field? Well, and who, who would one contact if they really approach the point? I'm not familiar with the Islamic Development Bank, but a lot of our, like, contacts from our side are with the World Bank and DC. So I've already done several talks with to them about <coughs> the work that we are doing. And in the case of the water systems, there was that direct connection. So there's a lot of connection between the World Bank and Cornell. In fact, we had a big team from Cornell do a panel at the bank about a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. And so that connection is it. But with the Islamic back I'm not so sure maybe Sarah. I think the, the WIC team has worked a little bit with the Islamic Development Bank and I mean that's such an important uh, wheat growing region. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I don't have uh, information on, on what has prevented uh, some activities or why there is no more. I know there is some been some activities <coughs> uh, working out of, of, of Lebanon with also with uh, Organizations like ICARTA, that is the International Center for um, Dry Regions, and they are a big producers of wheat. So we can see future collaborations. For example, we are moving into climate resilient wheat. Uh, how we're going to to deal with higher temperatures, and so it is an area that we can explore because it's mutual uh, benefits for the regions that we work in and, and with the Islamic Bank will be interested in working with. So definitely, there's some room for collaborations there. So if somebody were to want to contact Cornell, is there like a central site where they have to find each individual department? International programs, programs. is a great place to start. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd be happy to give you the director of international yes. programs uh, contact information when it okay. goes. I'm going to cast out and see if there are any other questions in the audience. We have some time for a few more questions. Um, Let's go here and then any, any others? Is the uh, expedited um, Crossbreeding that Jean-Luc talked about, is that considered uh, genetic modification? It's, it's not. It's okay. not. Okay. So, so we, we just do traditional crossing. I mean, we identify the individuals that we want to cross using biotechnologies, but um, ultimately the, the process is this, I mean, anybody can do that without extracting DNA if they wanted to. So, so it's not regulated in any particular way. <coughs> it's one of the many tools in the toolbox of a plant breeder. Um, any other questions? 
Well, I have a question for you. Uh, maybe, Maricelis, you could, you could address this one initially. I mean, you, you've built this exemplary global collaboration, uh, global coalition. Uh, it's not a simple endeavor to bring such organizations together to work toward a common uh, global challenge. Could you talk about what are the strategies for how to engage and, and build coalitions globally? Um, I guess that the, you know, it's not only a challenge to bring them together, it's to keep them together and give them a, 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 a purpose. And I think that's the key part, is bringing them together with a mission. Um, communicating the need, what we have in common, the challenges that we have ahead. These are, we're talking about problems that we're trying to solve that are transboundary. Uh, like we're talking about pathogens, we're talking about climate change. And I think it's easy to, to understand the need and that those global problems require global solutions. Once you bring them together and attract them under that mission is by providing opportunities for them to grow from bringing in their expertise, seeing how it's value, no matter that it's uh, basic science, applied science, that if we're talking about uh, more social aspects <coughs> like gender awareness, how to bring that community together, giving a sense of community. Uh, we do a lot of that by uh, having conferences. Some people think that you know this is just a, a, a chance for scientists to just, just talk <coughs> and, and, and talk about their own research project, but I think it's, it's extremely important bringing that community together. Um, to see what we can do that it's more than one plus one equals two. It, it's, it's, it's amazing uh, what we can do when we bring expertise together and give them a sense of, of, of purpose and, and value and, and how it's, it's extremely needed and how to communicate that to their governments or institutions and policymakers, the donors, and, and just bring all that together. And I think um, right here we have great examples of how we are building more and more of that is essential. There's no way we're going to tackle the challenges that we're facing as one institution or as a one program or one discipline. I think it requires all of us together. Great. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to comment. To to yeah. Mm -hmm. So so I mentioned that, that the Gates Foundation, DFID, came to us in part because we knew about this technology of genomic selection. But I think another component is that they recognize Cornell as an honest, <coughs> an honest broker among all of the different partners. That we've sort of portrayed all of these uh, international crop research centers as as a family that gets along happily, but there's actually quite a bit of competition between them. They're they're all after the same pool of resources, and so it's important for them to know that. And and they, I think you know, Cornell has a reputation that they deal fairly across the board, uh, and so that's a I think a, an important reason why donors have come to us. That's a great point. So I'm going to give the panelists a little bit of a warning that I'm going to ask each of you to comment for you know, 25, 30 seconds on the future for Cornell and the potential to engage internationally through partnerships to make a difference in the world. So your final profound thoughts that you can leave us with. But before we do that, and while you're thinking, I want to make sure there aren't any other burning questions out there in the audience. Okay, if not. We'll start with you, Jean-Luc, and we'll move okay. on to the Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll start with, with something that I find challenging in this line of work, and that is that, that um, I'm attracted to Cornell. I, mean, I work for USDA, but I'm attracted to Cornell because it's an educational institution. We value education. We believe that by <clears throat> granting bachelor's, master's, PhDs, that we're generally making the world a better place. And then, but somewhere along the way, you know, we have to deliver these cassava varieties. I mean, there's a product that we have to develop, and, and those two goals don't necessarily always entirely sync up. They're, they're sometimes more efficient ways of delivering the cassava variety than training a PhD student. And so I, this is kind of an area of friction that, that um, I think we need to uh, bring our creativity together so that, so that Cornell can continue with these projects um, and do both the thing that it's really its core mission of education along with this development. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so we need your creativity. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I think there's a huge future in in getting PhD level research to address on the ground real problems that affect people and finding solutions to those problems. And fortunately, the 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 sort of donors like the Tata Trust and the Gates Foundation um, are increasing. And so foundations can play a big role in, 
in creating this match between PhD research and and more on the ground uh, development work that needs to be done. I think uh, the challenge will continue to be acceptance on the campus itself for uh, faculty and for deans and others to see that you can actually do rigorous PhD research while addressing real life problems. And what I'm trying to do in our program is to keep emphasizing that point. Right, thank you. Kelly, your view for the future? Yeah, so I, I mean, the, the second, you know, one of the comments John Luke made, uh, you know, Cornell does have a, have, have a reputation within the international agricultural research community of, of uh, you know, being a trusted partner, being someone that, that they can trust to, to, to be fair in, in terms of how we do our research and how we interact with our partners. And we, we have a reputation that I think very few places you know, have in terms of international agriculture. I think we're one of a, probably a handful of institutions in the entire world that has the, the, the type of expertise um, and the, the global reach and the international reputation to actually be able to tackle some of these problems that are facing us. And we're, we're at a point now where we, we have very significant um, challenges facing international agriculture and it's going to take innovative solutions, it's going to take a mix of basic research, but it's also going to take some very applied research and, and actually uh, you know, working within these countries to, to drive this to, to real change in, in people's lives. And I, you know, one of the things that you know, one of the things that really brought me to Cornell is the fact that I think this is one of the few places in the world where you can actually do and work on both ends of that spectrum. I I see Cornell as an incubator for great ideas, technology, but also as a leader driving these technologies that are in the lab or in the classroom to the world. I think we have a responsibility and have done it really well. And I think I, I think a lot can be done, especially when we have so much challenges with uh, producing public goods and, and as an academic institution, training the next generation of scientists, make it science stronger across the globe and making sure that we provide the opportunities that we have here to other students and, and faculties around the world, creating those coalitions, those partnerships, and bringing everybody together, and uh, delivering the message to uh, policymakers, donors, that a lot more needs to be done, and that we cannot just uh, let down the world, that, that we need to continue investing in public goods and, and reaching out to those that need it the most and can benefit the most from science and technology. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I want to thank all of you for coming this afternoon. I know that your time here on campus is short and precious, so thank you for coming and uh, learning about these amazing examples of how CALS is out there in the world engaging and, and bringing the, the research um, that, that we do for um, public good out there to the world. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your time here. Beautiful weather we have on order just for you and during your short time. Thank you.